We've spoken about the fact that the physical picture here in opening Hebrews 12 is a race, verses 1 through 3. We're in a race. We've got a cloud of witnesses. I know you probably heard that a cloud of witnesses, they're in the stands, and they're cheering you on, and they're trying to help you get there, and that would be wonderful if that's the case. But the point is, he spent a whole chapter making them witnesses. And the cloud of witnesses that we have maybe not be cheering you and me on right now, but they cheer us on because they've given us the example to how to live by faith and why that's essential to please God. So I want us to take is that they have laid down the groundwork and we can follow that path. They are a cloud of witnesses. They confirm to us that this is the route to go. They're witnesses. And and how you want to do as a cheering in a tennis match, uh, that's, uh, that's fine. I'm not sure that's happening, but I know what's happening. And that is important to me. They may not know who I am. They may not be in the grave looking down upon me and sit, saying, uh, I'm, I'm watching you. I always thought my, my grandparents did that. And I always wanted to be a good fellow because when they died, I thought they would maybe looking on me, trying to school me a little bit more. But Ecclesiastes says that's not the case. They're alive. They've got a lot more glories to be looking at than me. But what they've done, they've laid the groundwork, and that's what he's saying here. And who do I look upon? I don't look at the crowds and say, hey, they're on my side. I'm looking at Jesus. And he is the one that has the one we look at. And we, so we talk about in question three, what is the sin which so easily beset us? He doesn't tell us, but what did he tell us? that it has to do with our faith, that we're laid at why every, every, lay aside every weight. We, we don't want to be hampered and cumbered because we're running a race. You get the picture. We're so easy to sell us, set us and run with patience. So we are kind of witnesses, lay aside every weight which has beset us, and we're going to be walking by faith. Maybe faith becomes that general thing that, that, that uh, we need to walk by, and there's things that hinder our faith. But there may be specific sins that hinder you that you keep working at. You still got to lay it aside. A lot of times these people were losing their faithfulness to the Lord. And they, their faith in Christ as being the standard of righteousness was, uh, was hindering them. They, they had left that. They're on the verge of leaving that. And they need to set aside that weight. Whatever caused that weight, whether I want to get along with my Jewish family, uh, so I'm going to kind of go back into that religion. Uh, they, they need to lay it aside. He doesn't, he's, he doesn't be real specific about that, but it has to do with hampering us, our walk in, in, in the faith. And so what quality do we need when we, we journey in, into heaven is that we need to, to run with, with patience, the race that is set before us as we look un, unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that's why we must look to Jesus. That's kind of where we are as we start this morning. And when he says he's the author and the perfecter, what do you think about that? Why does he say he's the author? Because who starts, who starts a book? Who, authors usually write books. And they're the ones that, has, that have originated it. But see, because he's got the word perfecter there, I mean, he's the beginning and the finish. He is the complete one. Talk about my beginning and talk about my end to my faith. I look to whom? Jesus. Some translation have he's the finisher, which is exactly the point. He's the perfecter. The telescope zeroes in and brings it right to sight. And that's where we get our word telescope, perfecter. It's growing to maturity. It's the, getting the picture that you ought to be and bring it into focus. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And that's why we're, we're, we are to be involved in, in looking at him. So what did he do that we look at? And that comes, leads us into our next question. He says, for the joy that was set before him, did he go through some pain? Yeah, for the joy set before him, that's why he could endure. If you have no hope, if you have no something that you enjoy, we, we don't hope for bad things. We dread them. 
And we're not to be wishing, well, hope, I, I just wish it happened. I mean, I hope, I know what's ahead of me. He did too. I'm looking at Jesus. He was able to endure things that are unpleasant because there was a joy set before him. Isn't that your race? What if you're going to be running a race and they don't tell you how long the race is? You go, you do a 5K, say, well, I'm sorry, it's not a 5K. And you do a half marathon, well, he's not there yet. You do a marathon, and about that time, so I'm going to the motel, I've quit. <laughs> I don't know where the finish line is. I don't know where it leads to. And what, what it is, is that we do know, so we can finish. And we realize here is the pain we have to go through. So what did he do? He, he, well, the joy said before, he endured the what? The, the cross. It killed him. He gave in. He gave up the ghost. I think he's on the cross when that happened. But he wasn't defeated by death. He could say this finished and gave up the ghost. He had completed his work of, of establishing the will of God to save man from their sins. And he knew he'd be raised from the dead three days later, called into heaven and all those things. Jesus prayed. He endured the cross. We asked the question, was Jesus suffering at Calvary? Let's take the merely out of it. Was it physical pain? When you're thirsty and don't have anything to drink, is that painful to you? Oh, no, it's no big deal. It's no big deal to me. Because you, all you think about, I need water, and there's no water. Or there's water, water everywhere, and it's salt water, and I can't have a drink. You're out fishing, and you get, you get thirsty. And you, I, didn't bring the, I didn't bring the water. What? Water, water everywhere. I can't have any. And that, that's panic time. But he went through, I thirst. And we, we read over, sometimes, you know, the, I think about the pain of the nails in the hands and the sword went through him after he's dead. But the scourging, and that was part of the cross. That prepared you for the cross. That would kind of increase the, your death time. They would, and he, it, was he so weak that he couldn't carry the cross member? They had to have somebody help him? Is that, is that, is that true? What does that tell you about him? A am, I, am I inserting something that God doesn't say when I see him carrying his cross? That he was in a weakened condition? No, that's exactly what's happened. He suffered physically. The question is, is that merely what he suffered? And it was something that has nothing to do with the nails penetrating your flesh and the tendons and your, all of the feelings and the nerve endings exploding through your brain. What did he do? Was there shame connected with the cross? And yet, that was the way in which he was going to redeem us from our sins. And he, he knew he was paying the penalty for his sin. He didn't take our little sins on him on the cross. I'm dying for all the homosexuals that ever lived, never will live, and all this, that. He paid the price for all of those sins. It wasn't transferred to him. Oh, him. He knew no sin. But he was made to be sin. Why? Because I'm paying the price for sin. The wages of sin is what? Death. And I'm doing that for you. One of the things that helped me in the 70s and 80s with people who said that Jesus' perfect life was tr you know, transferred to us and God looks at his perfect life and we're still sinners. Jesus, you're, you don't know everything. And God's overlooking your weakness. He'll overlook the Methodist preacher's weakness because he doesn't know about or he doesn't know about baptism. He doesn't know about the, the the church or anything like that. But you know, you don't know everything either. So it was Neo Calvinism was being built. You just go along. And you you don't know everything, so you can fellowship everything. 
And it got to the point where we were in a church that the, the younger people might have said, why couldn't we accept a Baptist into our fellowship? And the preacher said he thought he might call on the Methodist preacher for, for leading prayer. That's how far it got. And we can accept Baptists. You know why? We got scripture. We got scripture. Don't they get baptized to get into the church? Who cares what church? You know, he gets into the church, that's baptism. That was enough for the people I was hanging around because they were listening to preaching. That was leading people. Out. And one of the things that helped distinguish that in my mind, Jesus never lived the perfect life for me. You find the scripture. But I'll find you plenty of them. He died for me. Great difference in application leading to a doctrine that's taken people into denominationalism and ultra-liberalism. And so what a text says is very important. And what meaning we have, so we're having a Bible class and we're able to say, well, if he didn't, if he just paid the, the penalty for my sins, that means he died. Well, I can understand that. And he did do that for me, didn't he? Yes. And you won't contradict anything else. And you won't become a Calvinist transferring sins to one another because you didn't do it, you, you didn't transfer sins to Jesus Christ either. I said, well, interesting, we will do that, but we'll fight the Calvinists. Why? What's, what standard do you have to stand on? If he transferred it, sins to Jesus, Adam could be transferred to me. And the concept is I'm clothed with Jesus' righteousness and I stay a, a sinner and Jerry, you don't have the humility to think you, you're not going to be a sinner. No, but the Bible doesn't call us sinners. We're justified. We're not continuing to sin. If we are, we're not doing right. But we do sin. And all of those things become factors where in our minds, we better, we better have the word of God set so we can go through these avenues. But one of the things, learn, what did he suffer if it weren't? I feel the weight of everybody's sins. No, he felt the death. He paid the price of it, which was cause of sin. There's no, there's no, I'm not separating the sin from it. I'm just saying that what he did, he, he died for our sins. The penalty was there. And God was appeased in his wrath through the blood of his sacrifice that was able to take away the guilt of our sins and be a basis for our justification while we sin from time to time. And so it's this text says it was the shame of the cross. Did the cross have any shame connected with it in our day? You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, people won't wear necklaces and have the cross on. That's, I'm not speaking about that. But at one time, that wasn't something that was glorious in our society. And I'm glad we can have a cross and that is a positive thing to people. It reminds them what Jesus has gone through. That's fine in itself. But the point is, at the, the cross in, in the times of Jesus and, and, and God's eternal purpose knew that. <laughs> that indeed, that was a shameful thing to be crucified. That was only for the worst criminals and they would look and they and we see the scene of him on the cross while he's still alive by going through the physical pain knowing what he's bearing and because he is he is the paying the guilt of uh, the pain of our sin we, we've studied in Hebrews that that Jesus prayed to be delivered and his prayer was heard. I thought he died. When Jesus says, my God, my God, what house thou forsaken me, he's got so much sin upon him that God can't look at him. That's the concept people have. Turn his back. No. I know he, his prayer was heard. Does God hear prayer of a sinner? It wasn't sin on him. God heard his prayer. So what do you mean? How long did Jesus, 
hanging on that cross before he died. Relatively small amount of what crucifixion was like. Because why did they go break legs? To hurry up death, and there were two men still alive. Jesus had already died. I think his prayer was heard. And what he says, my God, my God, what hast thou forsaken me? You're letting me die. He forsook him that way. Not that he's so horrible to look at. I, I turn my back upon him. Is that he was going to pay the price and that's death. And he left him to die. But he didn't leave him. Even in his prayers. And, he, and that's why, God, I commend unto you my spirit. Well, I'm not listening to you. <laughs> I hadn't died yet. I'm going through the, you've already forsaken me. I, I, how does that all work? How does, he, how does he have a relationship with God, with confidence, and God's turned his back on him? You forsook me, and now you, I come into you, my spirit. You're going to have to make harmony of that, or, or don't care. And we care, don't we? And what we realize is the depth of, of things, of realizing we put things knowing this is what happened and what's harmonious is the fact that he forsook him on the cross. He let him die. But he was always there with him. Hearing his prayers. And he answered them. We studied that in Hebrews. And you want to ignore that? I don't. I'll factor it in. And what you end up having is that complete picture. It wasn't just physical pain. It was the shame of the cross. And how did he react to it? That's in the text. What did he do? What was his attitude toward it? Well, he certainly, you know, was mentally anguished because he was concerned about those that were through ignorance or ill-advised actually crucified because he, he felt for them. Forgive them, but they don't know what they do. That's but right. That'd be some kind of mental attitude toward them. Okay. Not just his physical thing. That, that's very true. So let's, let's go down into the word despise. What does your translation say? And that, that's very true. His attitude is there toward what, why he's there and all the things he's going through. But he says, right after the cross, he says he despises shame. What does your translation say? Somebody says the same thing, but it means to, I kind of look down on it. <laughs> I'm despising shame. I don't care if shame is connected with the cross. I look down on that. That doesn't bother me. I will go through the suffering of shame. And when the people ridiculed him on the cross, and come down from that cross, and he's, Jesus created them. And for him to do what he did, he took the shame of the cross, and that becomes a theme of Paul when he speaks about the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. They don't understand it, to Norris's point, and that will grieve Jesus in his public ministry. It will grieve him that they don't get it. But the point here that he's making, I believe, he just said, endured the cross, despising. That's a Part of simple phrase, just talk. Well, I endured the cross. How did you? I'm looking down on what they think the cross is shameful. I'm looking down on that, and that's why Paul, I will glory in the cross because he endured it. He went through it. That's the basis of my justification. And Jesus, see, that's why he can be my example. And there's no other person on this earth that I can look to that doesn't start and finish and give me the attitude of how I'll be running the race. As long as I'm with Christ, you can despise me all you want to. You can persecute the church all you want to. But I'm gonna focus upon him, and that's what we're doing. And we're going to realize that he completed his goal, because what did he do? He sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. That's the joy that was indeed set before him. So there was the physical pain, there was the mental attitude, anguish about it, you know, paying the penalty for our sins, 
for all the ignorance of people that that will that were there and, and that would be there. Uh, they know not what they do. I mean, there were so many other things other than physical pain that Jesus endured. But how that, that is a pretty great picture of you and me. What what stage are you at? Are you having to think about the joy of the end more today because you've got more negative things that you're going through in your life? Maybe. But you can go through that. And young people that may not have a lot of negative things in their life that's happening, they can have the energy to say, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> I'm a Christian. I'm ready to serve the Lord. They may not know what price it means to pay, but they have their joy. But I don't care what stage you're in or what circumstance you're in, what age you are, this is the one you follow. And what it happens, I have joy because I know what lies ahead certainly for me. And whatever it takes to get there, I'm willing to endure it. And look what he had to go through to get there. And that's the point that, that he's making. To what extent of suffering had the readers of this epistle not experienced yet? So now he drives it home to them with, with now, now for consider him, he was talking about Jesus, who endured gainsaying of sinners, they're, they're blasphemy, they're, they're trying to gain favor among men by finding trickery to, to, you know, to kind of cross him up with things, and they never did that, they didn't do it all. But they were all against him. Gain saints of sinners against himself that ye wax not what? That you don't become weary. Well, and he said we got to endure. And what happens when you endure? I just, I can't go anymore. <clears throat> I quit. Don't grow weary fainting in your souls. And this gets to our Answer, to what extent of suffering had the readers of this epistle not experienced? What had they not experienced yet that's in the text? They hadn't shed blood yet, had they? We've already seen that they took their possessions away. And, and people are blasphemed, their characters blasphemed because they're Christians. And that's what you go through with the people, some people of the world. But they had not died yet and shed their blood, who did? Jesus did. So he's still relevant in my race. You haven't paid the price that Jesus did. But they were on the verge of sealing their destiny in hell if they turned their back upon Jesus now. And that's why this whole epistle is there. And when we get to the end of the book, he said, this is a brief exhortation. Brief ex exhortation. Does that mean the whole book was a brief exhortation? But it's an exhortation. And notice, you have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. It says, and ye have forgotten the exhortation, which reasoneth with you as with sons. And all of a sudden, we're getting in. That exhortation is the chastisement. Is the condemnation of the route that they're going. It is the chastening that's taking place. And it very well may include in the writer's mind. He doesn't specify what particular type of chastisement it was. But I don't want to rule out that the warnings this whole book of trying to get them to see, don't leave the better <laughs> and, and go for the less. You get a better covenant, better salvation, all those things. That's an exhortation. And that is a little uh, condemnation of that type of thinking. It's, it's bringing people under the chastisement of God's word. And you need to understand that's because he loves you. And that's the picture we're about to see. They, you have not resisted. There's still life in you. You haven't resisted like Jesus has uh, to the death of the, on the cross and did all that shame. But 
but there's still hope in you. And I want you to realize that that's why this chastisement is there. And they've had to suffer as a Christian having their possessions taken away. Two, but here I, I think just the idea, you know, you, you sometimes have children. I didn't have to spank them. What did you do? Well, we won't go into that because it's probably abuse. You didn't yell at them, did you? But you may have talked to them and talked to them strong. And I didn't have to spank him. A little word got that done. Tears came out of his eyes. He's going to be okay. Well, that's a little chastisement, isn't it? And the idea of coupled with the warnings that come. So this, this whole word is there for them to accept. And all the exhortations are then to accept, which is showing them they're going the wrong way. People don't like to be told that. And then you could couple that with God allows us to be persecuted. When people take your possessions away because you're a Christian, God knows that. He wills that. He's allowing that. He's not out of control. I don't know how I could, I could stop it. He could stop it. That's why we go into very good detail when we study the Bible to realize that's a purifying process. And we can endure. He won't put more of us. We can, we can bear. That's where the temptation, we can endure that. We can even die. When he shed our blood, he hasn't taken away the real possession we have. So we can go through those things, but God is in charge. And he says, I'll, and he can use these things to refine us that maybe we had too much love of the things of this earth and we needed to learn and sometimes that can be in form of that in times of prosperity rejoice in times of adversity ignore times of adversity be depressed no consider 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 what? Consider everything. What's important to you? Is God telling me a message? What mistake did I make? Did I not diversify enough? Please ask these to talk to you about that. Spread it across the waters. You may find it one day. A lot of wisdom under the sun, but wisdom and living for Christ as well. So here's all the, I think the exhortation of the warnings. They're taking a verbal beating. We'll call it a spanking. And they needed to wake up to where, where they were heading. What was the chasing of the Lord? I'll ask you now, you, you give me your comments. I've given you what I think it is. And there's something else that can go in that that needs to be clarified. That'd be great. But whatever it is, it wasn't pleasant, was it? That's what we're seeing. It's, it's not pleasant. Should we expect to gain heaven without some chastening? I need warnings. You need warnings. Well, well if that's the chasing, uh, we've got to have that to keep us going or, or we'll get off track we, because we're not perfect. So we need to be warned about what our sins are. All who live godly will suffer what? Persecution. Can we expect to gain heaven without some chasing? I don't, I don't think so. Anybody? It's either yes or no. <laughs> I think we're all in agreement with that. <clears throat> now, in verses 6 to 11, give three results of God's chasing that those who had forgotten need to remember. They've forgotten this stuff. They've forgotten the exhortation. They, so what was the, what's the, the goal of the chastening? And that's in verses 6 through 11. Did you, could you uh, give me three points? And, and you say, well, I found seven. Okay. Go after it. But I, I found three. Did you find them? All right, let's see if we can do it together then. First of all, my son, regard not lightly the chastening of the Lord. So you take it seriously. Don't ignore it. Don't you, nor faint thou that are reproved. There's your chastening. 
reproved of, of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every, man, every, 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 every son whom he receiveth. So one of the things, the results of chastening is that I know God loves me. And that's what he wants them to understand about that. It is for the chastening that you endure. God dealeth with you as with sons. He emphasizes that again. Start, he quotes from Proverbs, and then he drives it home here. It says, for who has a father done chasten? He not much of a father if he doesn't. But who has one? But if you're without chastening, you're an illegitimate child. Chastening is part of being a, a parent. Chastening is part of being a father. And what is that chastening? The results of chastening is that he loves me enough to correct me. I may not be thinking that at the time when I got caught doing something that's embarrassing. But that's the result of chastening. And that tells me that the manner in which that chastening is delivered is very important. You're not here to destroy me, Dad. I understand that. I'm still alive, and I'm thinking about it. I'm not going to regard it lightly. But he makes the point that that is the result, is that if we weren't corrected, we have nobody that cares. Thank you. And we do. So that, that's, that comes out of chastening. And a father's going to have to do that whether the kid gets it or not. But that's the point that he wants these brethren uh, to have. <laughs> we have the father of our flesh to chasten us. And there it gets back to that. Now, we need, to re, we need to kind of respect the father of our spirits. We'll come back to that in a moment so we can live. He's talking about the spiritual side. For they indeed for a few days chase us, seemeth what good to them, but he for our proof, or for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. That's my second point that I see in the text. That I am through chastening, I am partaker of his what? I wasn't holy. <laughs> I was sinning. I needed chastening. And through the chastening, I'm waking up so I can do something about that, so I can be a partaker of his holiness. It's not pleasant. All chasing seemeth for the present to be not joyous, but grievous. But afterward, it yieldeth peaceable fruit unto them that have been exercised thereby. Point number three, what's the character of that fruit? What did it produce? Righteousness. He loves me. I'm more like my God in character, holy turning away from sin, and it's producing righteousness in my life. Preacher, preach to me some more. Teacher, instruct me some more. I'm here in a Bible class because I want to be, because I want to study the Word, because that's where I get my understanding of why, how I need to improve, how what I need to to change and it comes from the Word of God and that becomes very important so did you have another one that is very much in a text just because I say three doesn't mean that's the definitive thing and and uh, that's all I care about is there anything that that is there that that say well I've got a fourth one that's a little distinguished there but when I put all his arguments and those are the three he loves me. I'm more like his character. And I'm living a righteous life. Now, here's an interesting passage that, that it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to understand all the time. Uh, I, I told you we'll come back to the Father. In verse 9, does it say anything about the nature of man? I'm assuming it does. And I ask, what is it? What does he say? He, does he, has he contrasted us, the fathers of our flesh? That's, that's our physical family, because he's making a contrast. How does he describe our identity with the Father God, our Creator? 
He's the father of our what? Our spirits. That's the inward man. <laughs> Are we created in the image of God? He didn't have a physical body. So what is his image? It is a spirit. And we're in his image. We're spiritual people. And that shows you that there's a distinction. There's more to man than just his flesh. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We'll have a body changed to match the spirit that will be united with that body in a glorious state. I never find the spirit going out of existence. You have a spirit and it will live on forever. And we're trying to get strong enough to go. And we, we, we've been taking our corrections in a spirit that, uh, that the Hebrew writer wanted his readers to take it. And so we don't, we don't consider it lightly. We take it home. And you'll become a better person when you do that. It says that there is a part of me that's more than my physical flesh and blood. And that's what you're concentrating upon. So I commend you for, for being here in our Bible class. In verses 12 through 13, what picture do, do you see? This is interesting to hear what you'd say. Because, you know, I don't know sometimes what to say. What, is he, what does he bring here? And I think, I think we can get the picture. Does it, is there a lot of rehabilitation going on? <laughs> is there some healing going on? Now, time, our time is up. Yes. Lift up the hands that hang down, palsy knees, make straight paths for your feet. And that which is lame be not turned out of the way, but rather be healed. We'll just stop there, but answer this for me in your studies. Is that the other person? I need to lift up their hands. I need to do that. It says do that. Or is it me? Who needs to get right with God? Or is it both at the same time? We'll try to clarify that next time. But most of the time, we only look at it one way. And it's in the context of heaven. So we're going to kind of work through that. And just who is he talking about that needs to be rehabilitated? Who is he speaking about there? And we'll have good reasons for all, for all those Possibilities, but we're going to pick one. Any any comments you have before we close? Okay. Thank you for being here, participating.